We would just be spinning our wheels if it wasn't for the anointing of God. I don't want a religion where we just go through the motions, go through rituals. But I want an experience like the Apostle Paul had on the road to Damascus. You know, I like to think that Saul of Tarsus had a religion. He was practicing his religion when he was heading down to Damascus to gather up the saints of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had religion and he was practicing it. But something happened on the road to Damascus when a bright light shone around him and he was struck down blind. And he looked up in the heavens and he saw the Almighty God. And if you do a word search or word study when he said, Who art thou, Lord? Now the question explains itself. He didn't have a clue who that was. But he said, Who art thou, Lord? And if you look up that word Lord in the original, it means supreme being. God of everything. He didn't know who that was, but he knew whoever it was, it was God. It was the true and living God. That's the reason when the Lord said, I'm Jesus whom thou persecutest. The Bible says he was astonished. He was shocked that the God he was looking at was Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. So religion will never get us to where we want to go. but it takes an experience with God. It takes an experience with God. Look at your neighbor and say, it takes an experience. Praise the Lord. Good to have you here today. And uh, just after our meeting today in the adult class, uh, the, all the Sunday school and youth ministries will gather in here and we'll have a time of family worship. Always a good time to worship the Lord together as a family. Hallelujah. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, we'll read a text and we'll talk about it. The Bible says in Ephesians 4 and 11, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Praise the Lord. I want to talk to us just for a few moments about perfecting of the saints. Perfecting of the saints. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I've always liked airplanes. Anybody else like airplanes? I remember as a kid, Watching there, when I, well, I hear an airplane's engine pass over, this is how you tell if somebody likes airplanes. If an airplane fi- flies over where you're standing, if a person likes airplanes, they're going to do this. Someone that doesn't like airplanes never hears the engine. But I remember all my life, I loved airplanes, and I remember going to Howard Brothers, that was Walmart before Walmart in Monroe, Louisiana. I remember going to Hired Brothers or TGNY, and I would buy these little balsa wood airplanes. Anybody else had those? I love those little things. They lasted for about 10 minutes. <laughs> they would last just very, very, very short period of time because they were so fragile, but they would fly so beautifully. And, and I remember my brothers, my brothers Earl and Glenn, they had a little yellow biplane airplane that had a handle and it had, had cords that would go to the airplane. The airplane was about here probably to that organ and it had a real engine on it and they would pour the gas in there and they would and they would turn that, that propeller to the and they would fly that thing around and around and around. Y'all remember that? And you could control the up and down and I tried to Google that the other day when I was studying for this lesson. I I couldn't even find one of them on Google for a picture. So that must be old ancient history, the old airplanes that would fly around and around and around and around. I remember when I started taking flight lessons, I remember in detail my first lesson, the best flight of my life. The first one is always the best. 
I remember all the hard work and learning to fly airplanes and all of the training. And, and one day in the early 90s, I received my first, my, my private pilot's license. And, and I was so excited about it. And uh, I was showing everybody my private pilot's license. I was so excited. And I remember an old crusty pilot looking at me and saying, son, you know what that is? I said, well, it's my private pilot's license. I fly airplanes. He said, that's your license to learn. Now is when the learning actually begins. And I look back after, uh, after nearly 1,000 flight hours that he was right. When I received my private pilot's license and I was able to go out on my own, I was learning every flight I took. I'm still learning about flying airplanes. I've only had two forced landings in my thousand hours and both made it back to the airport. Thank God for training. Thank God for practice. Thank God for learning. I'm still a pilot learning. I'm still a work in progress. Now, this is something that I would like to take into what I'm about to talk about. As a pilot, I'm still learning. Spiritually, I'm still a work in progress. Spiritually, we're all still works in progress. None of us have made it yet. None of us have reached our potential yet. Praise the Lord. So we're still a work in progress. When, when I was thinking about this lesson, I remember the old Hemp Hill song, and y'all remember, he's still working on me to make me what I need to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be. He's still working on me. Praise the Lord. You see, when we receive the Holy Ghost, how many have received the Holy Ghost? How many have God filled you for the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues? Majority across the room. And, and if you haven't received that experience, just like the Apostle Paul, that experience is for you today. Praise the Lord. But when we receive the Holy Ghost, as the old crusty pilot told me, that's when the learning begins. Our perfecting process begins just after our name has been written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, I'm so thankful that Jesus doesn't expect me as a newborn saint of God to know as much as somebody that's been living for God for 50 years. And sometimes we're not as gracious as the Lord is. We expect somebody that's had the Holy Ghost two weeks to know how to do everything like we know how to do everything. Praise the Lord. He doesn't expect us to know it all. He doesn't expect us to be able to do it all. He doesn't expect our faith to cover it all. He doesn't expect it, and we won't know much just after our receiving the Holy Ghost. There is a process that begins that will take the rest of our lives to complete. Praise the Lord. I looked up the word process. A process is a series of actions or steps taken in order to achieve a particular end. You see, we have a process that's being uh, performed in our lives. We have an objective. Don't, don't we have an objective? There is an end game that we are shooting for. I want to hear him say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. I want to see him in peace. I want to feel the love and the joy and, and everything that heaven's going to have for us that will not be filtered through carnal flesh. Praise the Lord. Now, our text, our text states that God has given us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The five-fold ministry of the Lord. Now, why did he choose this? I, I don't know why he chose this, but I know what the purpose of this fivefold ministry is. 
Why does the church need these different men of God? The text told us in Ephesians 4 and 12, for the perfecting of the saints. Now, if you look at that word perfecting, it doesn't mean what we might think it means in this world. We think if something's perfect, that it's without flaws, that, it's, that, it, that everything's right, everything's going the right direction, everything is as it should be. That's not what this is talking about. This word perfecting comes from the Greek word katartismos. I don't speak Greek very well. There's some that say I don't speak English very well, much less Greek. But, but this word perfecting means to be complete. Not perfect in the way that we think of it as being, but, but the fivefold ministry of God completes the saints of God. Praise the Lord. That's a good word for it, to equip the saints of God, to put the word of God into the saints, to God's saints, to grow the saints. It takes the word of God to grow us. It takes the wooing of God to, new, to, to nourish us. And this comes through the preaching and the teaching of God's word. Now, the, the, the objective here is to eventually make the saint of God a stable saint of God. I look at little Andrew. He's a human being in every way. He breathes. He eats. He talks in his own language. So he's a person. But he cannot get up and do what I'm doing today because he's a baby. So the Lord expects to be growth in all of us as saints of God, to move forward, to, to obtain knowledge, and it takes that through the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God. Praise the Lord. So the objective is to, to eventually make a newborn saint of God into a stable saint of God. And the stable saint of God to grow and to mature and to become better at what they're doing and to move forward. Does that make sense? Now there will be times that the saint will need, the stable saint of God will need perfecting. We never get so mature that we don't need a little perfecting from the ministry of God from time to time. I've been living for the Lord now for 42 years, and I still have hang-ups. I still make mistakes. I still say things I shouldn't say. And sometimes I need a little perfecting. You see, it's called being a human being. We're going to do things and say things and be a part of things that we'll, we will regret later on. And there will be a man of God come through at some point in our lives to teach us and to preach to us and to pray with us and help us along the way. That is the way the Lord meant for it to work. We need the Lord working in our lives through the fivefold ministry of the Lord to perfect us or to make us complete. Now, personally, I believe this is one of the major reasons that the ministry has always been under so much attack from the enemy. Now, any pastor that's in the house today, any minister that's in the house today knows that there's times that you got up behind the pulpit to preach and teach, depressed, fighting things in your life. Can I get a witness? Because the enemy has to attack the minister's. Praise the Lord. The ordained of God, the minister of God has always been in a perilous place. And I believe it's especially so in the year 2022. You see, Satan needs to destroy the perfecter or the one preaching the word of God that will complete us. To destroy the sheep, he must destroy the under shepherds. The ones that are commissioned by God to teach and preach the word of God, to complete the saints. To, 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 to teach the saints, to, to mature the saints through the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. It's not the preacher by itself, but it's the Word of God being taught and preached by that minister that completes us. Praise the Lord. We must have a man of God in our lives. So it's the devil's desire to destroy the man of God, at least in someone's eyes. Praise the Lord. I looked up Jezebel, and when she was setting up her pagan worship system in, the, in, in Jerusalem, in, in the land of God, she destroyed the prophets. She massacred the prophets. She had to get rid of those that were opposing her. So in 1 Kings 18 and 4 and 13, 
it talks about how she, she destroyed the, uh, the prophets and there was a remnant that was saved, that was protected, but it was her desire to wipe out the prophets so her opposition would be destroyed. Now, Satan would love to massacre the ministers of the gospel. Praise the Lord. And I believe he's done a fantastic job in America of diminishing the minister in the eyes of the public. I remember when I was a kid, and that hadn't been that long ago. The minister was some of the most respected people in the community. In fact, I remember when they were the number one respected profession in the community. Y'all remember that? The preacher, the minister, the pastor of the community. But I began to look this up and uh, at the profession respect rankings for the year 2022. Now, this was a survey of how Americans view certain professions. And this survey was done by a uh, website called Zeti.com, if you want to look it up. But I looked up the professions. The number one professions that are respected by more people in America are doctors, scientists, and farmers. 83% of Americans have a favorable view of doctors, scientists, and farmers. Firefighters and teachers have an 82% favorability uh, rating in America. Nurses are 81%, all good professions. Members of the military, 80%. I don't understand why that's not closer to the top, but hey, I'll take 80% for our military. Garbage collectors, 74% of Americans look at garbage collectors in a favorable manner. Thank God for our garbage collectors. What would life be without them? Thank you, Lord. Police officers, 71%. Software developers, 65%. Uh, entrepreneurs, 65%. Lawyers, 63%. I'm surprised they're that high. Professional athletes were 63%. Accountants were 59%. Corporate CEOs were 56%. 56% of Americans had a favorability thinking of uh, CEOs. Coming in at a whopping 55% were members of the clergy. Just above TV and newspaper reporters. Social media, media influencers were at 44%, and reality TV stars and politicians were 41%. So just above reality TV stars and politicians, in the eyes of America, sets the clergy, the pastor, the evangelist, the teacher of God's word. Mm. The office of the clergyman has, has fallen very, very much in the eyes of America. This was kind of shocking to me. And, and no, look, look, I'll be the first one to admit that a lot of the clergy in America has brought this on themselves through some of the, the televangelists, some of the things they've done, and, and, and it's, it's scandalous. That's a good word for it. I mean, they brought a lot of this on themselves. But I, this purpose today is to get you to see you have got to have the five-fold ministry in your life. Praise the Lord. You've got to have a pastor that loves you and prays for you. And you can support a pastor in Louisiana... You can support one in Tennessee if you want to, but I promise you, that pastor wasn't on his face this morning in wee hours of the morning praying for your soul and your family. You got to have a pastor. You got to have a preacher. You got to have evangelists in your life. You got to have people that are personable to you, that love you. Praise the Lord. Now, we need to realize that we, the church, everybody say, we, the church. Point to yourself, you're part of the church. We the church. 
Now, I realize that the church is in various stages of development, and I, I understand that, and I respect that. We don't talk about it. We've already talked about that, how we're in different stages. Some of us just received the Holy Ghost a little while ago. Some of us have been living for God all of our life. We're in various stages, but we are part of the church. Say, I am the church. We must realize that we, the church, need, quote, unquote, perfecting. We need completing. Guess what? The doctors cannot do it. They can be of help to our physical bodies, and thank God for doctors and nurses. Thank God for medicines. But they will never do anything for our souls because they are not equipped to do that. The firefighters cannot do it. They can put out the fire in our homes and, and the things of that nature. And thank God for fire, fire, firefighters and EMS personnel. But they will never put out the fire of depression, put out the fire of sin, put out the fire that's destroying our soul. Right. Right. TV reporter sure can't do it. Everybody hold up five. It's the five-fold ministry of God that has been tasked to do it. Don't allow society, don't allow the prince of this world to drive a wedge, between, a wedge between you and the ministry. You know, all of the ministers, especially the ones of the apostolic faith, we're all different. We all have areas that we're better than other areas. There are some excellent teachers. There are some excellent preachers. But we're all different and we make up the whole. I know so I've heard people say, and I pro I've probably been guilty of saying it myself, that, that, that I have my preferred preachers. Let me tell you something. If the preacher is preaching the Word of God, he may have a different delivery. He may not scream as much as the other guy does, but if he is teaching and preaching the Word of God and putting that in us, that's what we need at that particular time. The Lord knew who was going to be here this morning and who was going to hear this message. And it's amazing how God puts things together. Amen. Nothing just happens with God. Elder, nothing just occurs to God. Oh, Lord, I need to do something down there today. He declares the ending from the beginning. He knew who on October the 23rd was going to be at Calvary Pentecostal Church to hear this preacher teach. So it's no accident. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So don't allow, the, allow this world and this, the enemy to drive wedges between us and the ministry. I need a preacher in my life. I have men of God that I can call that, that speaks into my life. We all need preachers in our life. Don't try to do it alone because you will never be successful without the five-fold ministry of the Word of, the, of God in your life. Now, I want you to understand something. Ministers are not perfect either. Now, I don't know why the Lord chose this method. I told you before, I don't understand it. Why he put a perfect message into the hands of an imperfect man, I don't know. But he did. He chose man, imperfect people, to teach and preach this word. I don't understand that. We're not perfect. No preacher in this place today is perfect. No preacher standing behind a pulpit today is perfect. And as you get closer to the minister, you will be able to see his imperfections. As you get closer to the man of God, you will understand that he has warts. Because he's just a man. You see, the pastor, the preacher, the evangelist, the five-fold ministry, all of those ministers go through the same thing that everybody else goes through. I could, I could turn this microphone over to any of these preachers in here, and they would tell you that they have stood behind a pulpit depressed, fighting battles, not wanting to be there. I heard about the preacher who dreamed he was preaching and he woke up and he was. <laughs> <laughs> he, 
Any preacher that's ever been preaching any time, they, they come behind this pulpit with massive headaches. They preach nauseated. Don't ever look at your preacher, your pastor, your evangelist, or the man that's preaching or teaching you and think that he's perfect because he's not. He is a human being just like you. That old saying, familiarity breeds contempt. Let me tell you something. If, if, when you get close, to, now look, you married your wife, right? She was a princess. She was a queen. You married your husband. He was a king. He was a hunk. He was all that. But when you started living with him and you started living with her, you started understanding that she or he has warts. They snore. They have habits that just rakes you over the coals. Well, when you get close to your pastor, you get close to the evangelist, you get close to the preacher, you're going to realize that they're just people. If you're not careful, that familiarity will cause you to lose respect. Will cause you to, to not look. Look, it's never been about the preacher anyway. It's about the word that he's teaching. It's about what he's preaching, not about him. Sometimes the preacher has more month at the end of the money like everybody else. Sometimes the preacher makes stupid mistakes like everybody else. But it's not about him. It's about the word. Now, his life must be above board. I grant you that. A preacher's life must be above board. But it's never been about the preacher. It's about the word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the, perfect, the perfecting process, the completion process, takes us from a baby saint of God to a mature saint of God. Now, I talked a little bit about Andrew a little while ago, and uh, he's a little baby. Of course, he's got Pop Pop's heart wrapped around that finger. But when a baby, you act like a baby. You talk like a baby. You babble. You crawl, and you walk like a baby. You understand the world as a baby. You eat like a baby. Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 11, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. In 1 Peter 2 and 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. It was never the Lord's intention for us to stay babies. In 20 years, I don't want Andrew babbling and taking bottles at bedtime. In 20 years, I want to go to Texas Roadhouse and eat a 16-ounce ribeye with the man. So the perfecting process, the completion process, takes us from baby spiritually to mature, stable saints of God. Growth takes place. Knowledge increases. Faith increases. The spiritual diet changes through the perfecting process. In Hebrews 5 and 13, the Bible says, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a baby. Be strong, but strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So there is a process that must take place. And it through the perfecting of the saints. The Word of God takes care of this for us through self-study, through preaching and teaching. The Word of God builds strong spiritual bones. And, and once we begin to take on the Word of God, I remember when I opened up my first textbook of, uh, of EMS, my first EMT textbook. I got it in, got it in that day through the mail, I believe it was. And I was starting my first EMT course the next week. And I remember grabbing that textbook and, and I opened it up and I went, oh God. The pictures made me sick in my stomach. Because it was some gruesome pictures in there. I wasn't ready for that. Because I was a baby. I wasn't even, even in the EMT class yet. 
But I can't tell you after I went through that and went through paramedic class and the years of experience of things I was a part of that I never thought another word, another thought about it because I was skillful. The words in that textbook and that was taught to me by the instructor grew me into a paramedic. Let me tell you something. We have to have this word instilled in our hearts and minds. We have to have this or we will forever be a baby in Christ. Praise the Lord. It's hard to live the epistles before you go through the book of Acts. I say hard. It's impossible to live the, the epistles without first going through the book of Acts and learning. Praise the Lord. The apostle Paul was writing these letters to, to mature saints, supposedly. To establish churches, supposedly. Takes the word of God through self-study, preaching and teaching to build up our strong spiritual bones. Now, during the perfecting process, there will be pop quizzes. I never did like pop quizzes. I was thinking the other day about pop quizzes, and I, I don't think I was ever prepared for one of them. But I think about Job. He had a pop quiz. Yeah, didn't he? Thank God Job was a mature saint of God. Praise the Lord. He passed and came out on the other side smelling like a rose. Now in James 1 and 2, the Bible says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. You know how we're going to be able to make it through these temptations? How we're going to be make it through these trying times? It's because it's the Word of God that's on the inside of us. Praise the Lord. The Bible talks about the helmet of salvation and the armament of God. Why wasn't the helmet of the breastplate of salvation? Or why wasn't your shoes, your feet shod with the preparation of salvation? I've often thought it was very unique that God put the armament in place the helmet of salvation, because we're going to store knowledge right here. We're going to store, store the word of God right here. And then when we face situations like this and we face a pop quiz uh, and we go through temptations, uh, we're going to have the knowledge instilled in us to be able to walk through that problem in that situation. Praise the Lord. And if we weren't taught, if we did not have self-study, if we didn't have the word of God implanted on the inside of us, then we may not be successful when walking through the trial. Praise the Lord. You see, the struggle is making us complete. Yes, it's hard to walk through tough times, but we are growing. Our character is growing. Our faith is growing. Our influence is growing. Anybody can hold the line when everything is hunky-dory, but when people see us still hanging in there when we are in a struggle, and the reason we can hang in there was because we have the Word of God on the inside of our lives. Praise the Lord. When people see us stable when others are falling, when people see us holding on when others have let loose, that's what gets the attention of people. Praise the Lord. I think about King David. King David had to go through some perfecting, quote unquote, in his life. I recall when his army was on the battlefield and, and Joab had taken the, the army to battle. In fact, the Bible says, when kings go to battle. The time of the year when kings go to battle. Where was David? He was on the rooftop. He was at home doing things he shouldn't have been doing, as possibly we will from time to time, be doing things we shouldn't do, saying things we shouldn't say, listening to things we shouldn't hear. But in David's case, his actions caused another man to lose his life. And I love to mention Uriah the Hittite's name because I never want to forget Uriah the Hittite. If you remember the story, after Uriah had been killed in battle after the commandment of David, Bathsheba, the dead man's wife, became David's wife. And after all of this, David needed a little perfecting. He needed a little completion. And the Lord did it the way he will always do it, through the man of God and his word. He sent the prophet Nathan to David and in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13. And David said unto Nathan, 
I have sinned against the Lord after Nathan told him that he was the man. David received the word of God from Nathan and said, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. David responded in the right manner when the perfecting process happened. Have you ever been preached to from the pulpit? Let me, show, let me get a show of hands who's been preached to. And you know what? I've had people tell my wife and I've had people tell me, how did he know? Well, I'll give you the answer to that. He didn't. He didn't know. But the Lord was doing some perfecting. So Nathan came to David to do a little perfecting. And David received the word of God from the man of God in the right way. He repented. God forgave him and David's throne stayed intact. And if you remember, Jesus Christ was in the lineage of King David. That could have all been changed if David hadn't responded to the perfecting time, the completing time. I looked at King Saul after I looked at David and he responded in a totally different manner. When the man of God came to, quote unquote, perfect him with the word of the Lord, Saul had disobeyed the Lord's command, and, I, and I'm not going into what he did. It's a whole other sermon. But, but after he was confronted by Samuel, he then proceeded to blame the people that was under his command. He began to, to blame others and this and that, and they're responsible, and I'm not responsible. They did it. Instead of David's, like David, I'm sorry, Lord. I did it. Forgive me, Lord. In his perfecting process, he responded the wrong way. And in 1 Samuel 15 and 26, the Bible reads, And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. You see, if the Lord cares enough about me, and he cares enough about you to send a man with a message, The way we receive that message has a lot, a lot of power in it, whether to the good or whether to the bad. Well, I know Brother Butler. I know Pastor Coon. I know such and such. There's nothing special about them. Let me tell you something. When Pastor Coon stands behind this pulpit, and he teaches us, saith the word of God. When Elder Jones, Pastor Jones, stands behind this pulpit and teaches and preaches the word of God, or any of these ministers, or any other minister that's ordained of God, stands behind this pulpit and, and teaches or preaches the word of God, and we slough it off because I know the man. I've seen him on a bad hair day. He drives an old wore out car just like I do. We, be, we got to be very careful how we handle the Word of God when it's taught or preached by the five-fold ministry of the Lord. I want to be like David. Lord, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I'm so sorry. I want to receive that teaching. I want to receive that Word. Hallelujah. Because I want the Lord helping me in my cause. I want the Lord helping me in my life. He rejected Saul. From that point on, Saul was a rejected king of Israel. If you remember, he even resorted to going to witches, trying to find the mind of God and tried to kill David after he realized what was going on. And, and it was just a horrible downhill life from there. Praise the Lord. Everybody say the perfecting of the saints. I want to be complete. Say, I want to be complete. It's going to take a preacher in the Word of God. Praise the Lord. I love you. I appreciate you. In just a few moments, everybody will come in and we'll have a, a time of family worship. But uh, the perfecting process, let's never get to where we won't allow the Lord to work on us and chip on us. I love that 
that picture that Ashley put up there. Throw that back up there, Brother Michael. Perfecting of the saints. The Lord has a chisel and a hammer perfecting us, completing us. And one day we're going to be masterpieces. I love the way she did that. The Lord's working on us, making us who we need to be. And it will always be connected to his word when he's working on us. Praise the Lord. Perfection, perfecting of the saints or completion of the saints. Thanks so much for being here with us today. One thing we truly value at Calvary is community. And whether today is your first time joining us or Calvary has been your church for years, we truly want to connect with you. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week online at springfieldcalvary.church and on Facebook. We believe God has something unique to say to you and our hope is that you feel His love stronger today than ever before. Thanks again for being with us and have a wonderful day, a wonderful week in the Lord.